Armando Hasurugan, biology and medicine videos, please make sure to subscribe. Join the forum and group for the latest videos. Please visit Facebook Armando Hasurugan, like, and here you can ask questions, answer questions, and post some interesting things such as your artworks. And you can also change the quality settings of these videos to the highest one for better graphics. Now in this video, we are going to talk about active transports. Um, and in the previous video, we actually talked about passive transportations, but we're talking about active transports, which actually require energy. And remember, passive transports does not require any, any energy. And there are two types of passive transports. We have the simple diffusion and we have the facilitated diffusion, which requires a protein transport. Now, passive diffusion is where solutes move down their concentration gradient in passive transport. And this is essentially if we have a container with a permeable membrane, this is for facil facilitated, and it's an aqueous solution, which means that the solvent is water and the solutes are in water. And as you can see, the solutes are more concentrated on the right-hand side. And so the solutes will move down its concentration gradient to an area where it's highly concentrated to an area where it's lower, lower concentrated. So it's moving from the right to the left. And this is facilitated diffusion, or which is part of passive diffusion, which requires no energy. Active transport also uses a protein transporter but it requires energy. So let's look at the difference here. So we have a container again with a permeable membrane and we have a transporter as you can see in the middle and this is an aqueous solution so the water is the solvent and as you can see the solutes are still highly concentrated on the right. Now normally it will move down its concentration gradient but in active transport the solutes move against its concentration gradient and so requires energy. So it moves to an area where it's highly concentrated and it's the reverse of passive. Now active transporters, let's just look at a quick example. Here we have a lipid bilayer, here we have a active transporter and the solutes as you can see are highly concentrated on the outside of the cell compared to the inside. Now this is an example of the primary active transport and we'll look at the difference soon. So here's a primary active transporter. Now the main energy used for active transport is ATP. What happens is that a solute will bind to the active side of this transporter and ATP will be used. A phosphate group will be attached to the transporter and when ATP is used this protein transporter will flip essentially because energy is used causing it to flip and the phosphate is still bound to it. The phosphate group is still bound to the protein as you can see. And so then the solute is released to the outside. So it, it's going against its concentration gradient. So here, the bound phosphate will cause a change in protein transport structure next. So now this bound phosphate group will then be released, causing the active protein transporter to flip back to its original um, shape, you can say. So once the phosphate is released, the protein transporter will return to its original shape and position. And so this process can ha occur again with ATP. ATP comes along and another solid can move up its, um, against its concentration gradient. Hope that made sense. And that was an example of a primary active transporter. So a active transporter can be divided, as we've seen, into primary and secondary. And we just see an example of primary. And in primary, the transports molecules against its concentration gradient. And this usually requires energy as an ATP. And so just quickly illustrating it again, we have a primary active transporter here. And we have two types of solutes. We have one in red and one in orange. Now, as you can see, there is more red on the outside and there's less orange on the outside. And there's more orange on the inside and less red in the inside. So ATP is used and it causes an orange solute to go against its concentration gradient because it's going to an area of high concentration of orange solutes. Now the difference between primary and secondary is that secondary does not require ATP. So secondary active transport actually transports molecules still against its concentration gradient, but it's driven by another molecule moving down its concentration gradient. So if you understand what this means, for example, the active secondary transporter is specifically a co-transporter. 
And so, for example, we have this orange solute, which is highly concentrated on the inside, which just moved in. It will go back down its concentration gradient, and then this will let out some energy because it's going down its concentration gradient, which will allow a red solute, which is highly concentrated on the outside, to move up against its concentration gradient. So the red solute is moving against its concentration gradient with the energy provided by the orange solute moving down its concentration gradient. Hope that made sense. So active transport, as we've mentioned, can be divided into primary active transport and secondary act active transport. Primary active transport um, is where energy is released by ATP hydrolysis. Uh, and it, this drives the solute or molecule to move against its concentration gradient. Now, concentration gradient. This also means the electrochemical gradient. And I'm not going to explain what an electro electrochemical gradient is, but there is a video I have which uh, explains the neuron and how electrochemical gradients are involved. And I think you should click on that if you want to know more about electrochemical gradients. Now let's look at an example of a primary active transport, an actual example. And a good example of a primary active transport is a sodium-potassium ATPase, or sodium-potassium pump, which you might have already heard of. Now the sodium-potassium pump is very popular uh, in all cells, essentially, because of the different concentrations of potassium and sodium in the extracellular fluid and the intracellular fluid. And this potassium and the sodium potassium pump is important in regulating uh, these two ions, uh, the balance of these two ions across the membrane. To understand the role and mechanism of the sodium potassium pump, we have to learn about the different concentrations of potassium and sodium in the extracellular fluid and the intracellular fluid. So for example, in the extracellular fluid, we have about four millimolar of potassium and we have 145 millimolar of sodium. So as you can see, Sodium is highly concentrated on the outside. In the cytosol, in the intracellular fluid, in, inside the cell, we have about 140 millimolar of potassium and about 12 millimolar of sodium. So as you can see, in respect to the outside, potassium is highly concentrated in the inside of the cell, and sodium, there's only a little bit of sodium in the inside. So we know that primary active transport uh, transports solutes against its concentration gradient. So therefore, we can say that ATP is required, and that sodium will bind to an active site. Not here, but it will fit here. So two sodiums will bind to, to their active sites, and ATP will be used. Phosphate will be bound to the protein, and this will make a conformational change, and it will flip this protein over. And so these two sodium ions will be released out into the extracellular fluid against its concentration gradient. And phosphate is still bound to this uh, protein transporter. Now, once this has occurred, potassium from the extracellular fluid can bind into their active sites. Not here, but it will fit here. So three potassiums can bind into this protein transporter. And then the phosphate from the protein transporter will be released, causing the protein transporter to flip back over into its initial position releasing the potassium inside the cell. And ATP can be used once again, and this process uh, can continue. So sodium, two sodium molecules, will get pumped against its concentration gradient to the outside of the cell, and three potassium ions will get pumped back inside the cell against its concentration gradient. So two sodiums out, three potassiums in. And that was an example of a sodium, uh, sodium potassium transporter which is important in the neuron, for example, the membrane potential. Now, the other type of active transporter is secondary um, active transporter, which is a movement of a solute molecule down its concentration gradient, and this will provide energy, not ATP, it will provide a different type of energy um, for another solute to move against its concentration gradient, against its electrochemical gradient. And so, an example of this, here I have a cell, and here I have a co-transporter. We have uh, solutes, red solutes out here. They are highly concentrated on the outside of the cell in respect to the inside. And we have a second type of solute in the inside of the cell, these orange squares. So these orange are highly concentrated in the inside of the cell in respect to the outside. So the red one is solute 1, and it will move down its concentration gradient. 
And as this red solute will move down its concentration gradient, it will provide energy for solute 2 to move against its concentration gradient. So this red solute will move down its concentration gradient, providing energy for the solute to move against its concentration gradient. And as I mentioned, the transporter, the protein transporter, is a co-transporter. What do I mean by co-transporter? Now, a basic type of a protein transporter in the membrane usually moves one type of solute up or down its concentration gradient. And then we have a type of protein transporter which moves two or more molecules in the same direction, and this is called a symporter. And then again, we have another type of protein transporter which moves two or more molecules in opposite directions, and this is called an antiporter. Now, a symporter and an antiporter are co-transporters because it involves a movement of more than one molecule, usually two. And I'm sorry I cannot give you an example of a co-transporter, but I will make sure to make a video about the respiratory system and the physiology of it because the red blood cells have a type of co-transporter to deliver oxygen and carbon dioxide back and forth from the lungs to the tissues. So that concludes the video on active transports. I hope you enjoyed it. Please like, comment, and subscribe. And please share this video. That would be actually really grateful. Thank you very much.